Hello everyone, Ladislas Lasmoris from TheWanderingInvestor.com. So today I'm in beautiful Boquete in northern Panama with Calvin Froge from Twitter. How are you, Calvin? Good. Cool. So I'm staying in Calvin's lodge here for a few days in Boquete. So today we'll be discussing Ecopetrol, which is the state-owned oil company in Colombia. So the government owns approximately 80% of the company. The rest is available to investors. It's possible to buy it on the New York Stock Exchange. And why I wanted us to discuss Ecopetrol is because I've been monitoring Colombia for quite a while from a real estate point of view. The yields in places like Medellin are extremely high. It's a market that I've, I've been considering entering. But I wanted to see how things would develop with the new president, Petro, who is a former Marxist guerrilla. So that's obviously never a positive thing. He was going on and on about banning exploration and putting all these like massive taxes on oil and gas companies. So none of that was very bullish for either real estate or Colombia in general or more specifically oil and gas in Colombia. So that's kind of the narrative and the stock, again none of this is investment advice, is priced this way. However, what we see is that the, the tax reform package was passed in Colombia and the impact doesn't seem to be as big as what people thought it would be. So Calvin, so I follow Calvin's Substack, so there's a link below, I pay for it, it's really good. And he wrote a whole analysis on Ecopetrol, uh, which was really good because it's both simple and it has numbers, there's not too much, sometimes you, you follow these analysts and it's just numbers, numbers, numbers and they forget the bigger picture or sometimes people are just all narrative and there's no numbers so you strike a good balance between the two and I essentially yesterday I initiated a position in Ecopetrol. So can you elaborate on your thesis? Yeah so <clears throat> I started following the company because they have a refinery in Cartagena that exports a lot of diesel. They were doing some uh, capacity upgrades to that refinery uh, anyone who follows the uh, uh, tanker markets or the refined fuels markets, uh, which is a market that I follow very closely. Uh, I have uh, invested a lot in uh, tanker companies, refining companies, uh, oil companies, uh, oil infrastructure, fuel infrastructure. I just got back from a, a fuels conference in Miami uh, where a lot of these uh, companies had uh, employees, uh, including Ecopetrol. Uh, Anyway, uh, I started looking at it because I knew that the world was going to be really short diesel. And I knew that it was going to be especially bad in the Atlantic Basin, in Latin America. Uh, Eco Petrol is uh, uh, one of the only companies in uh, South America that is exporting significant amounts of crude oil and refined fuels. Uh, Colombia actually exports more than they consume domestically. I believe it's the best kind of uh, trade balance in, uh, uh, for any of the you know, state-owned companies in uh, South America. So uh, at the time that I started following them, I want to say they were trading at around $15 a share. This was, uh, this was before they uh, uh, you know, elected Petro as, uh, as president. And uh, I, I think I bought 100 shares or something just to kind of keep an eye on it. And then uh, the uh, uh, election happened and the, you know, basically Petro got elected. There was still some hope that Hernandez was going to win. Um, the Hernandez was the, you know, more of the pro-business guy. He was a construction magnate. And anyway, after uh, Petro won, you can see basically the, uh, well, between the uh, kind of highs when they, I think they paid their last uh, dividend. Um, the stock basically did a beeline from like $20 to under $10. So, you know, it's not just like a little pullback. It's been a significant uh, sell-off, you know, a significant amount of uh, market capitalization wiped away, I think $20 billion or something. So it's, it's been a huge drop. And so after the, uh, the drop, uh, I started, you know, getting a lot more interested and, uh, and you know, building a pretty significant uh, position in the, in the company. I think my average uh, is around 10, 
ten fifty a share or so, which uh, I think the they closed Friday at around ten dollars a share. So I'm I'm a little underwater on it, but I'm I'm used to uh, you know kind of waiting for things to play out. I think that uh, with Echo Petrol, you have a situation where you know the rhetoric was awful. You know, Petrol was saying, "Yeah, he's you know he hates oil and gas. He's going to kill this stuff. He's going to get rid of it." He you sounds know, like Biden. Uh, it, it, he's really he said a lot of the exact same things that Biden said. So uh, you know he got into office, and then the actual reforms that were passed as law. Uh, you know, it was nothing like the original plans, for example, for an export tax where they would just, you know, ta- uh, put a steep, t- stiff tax on all exports. Um, the, uh, the taxes were changed to basically be on net profits. So uh, coal and uh, uh, basically all hydrocarbons uh, related industries have this, uh, this additional tax now. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the, the form that it took rather than the more aggressive uh, export-based tax that they had uh, planned for initially. It's basically like an additional 5 to 15 percent based on the 10-year rolling average of the uh, the price of the particular commodity. So for Ecopetrol, it's, uh, it's oil. Um, the uh, if you if you dig in and you look at you know what kind of impact that's actually going to have on their business uh, since it is a 10-year sort of you know rolling average, uh, it doesn't all come into effect at once. There are some like inflation adjustments. I really haven't dug in uh, to figure out exactly how the inflation uh, is calculated. But if you just look at the 10-year average, it's like $70 a barrel, and uh, so that is the basically additional 5% bracket. Um, if you uh, if you look at, there's a, they also changed uh, some of the uh, accounting regime. For example, a lot of uh, the oil uh, wells, they're basically, you know, it was a project that was done by multiple parties involved, and you know, maybe one party gets a royalty payment. Uh, previously, under the previous accounting regime, uh, the uh, royalty payments were deductible. Uh, you know, so it basically came off the uh, income statement. Um, as, a, as, as an expense, um, now those are no longer deductible. So uh, those are considered after tax. Uh, Echo Petrol announced that, uh, th- well, they put in their last earnings call that they thought that that was going to be a very marginal impact, so two to five points um, at, the, at the most. So, uh, you know, you're kind of worst case scenario. You're looking at maybe Echo Petrol in three, four years. You know, assuming oil prices stay where they are, is uh, is trading at you know with with like a 50% effective tax rate uh, versus you know the the effective tax rate today is 35%, right? So that doesn't justify a drop of 50%. So yeah, so you basically have a 50% drop for uh, you know in you know for the asset because of a theoretical tax hit of 15%. And by the way, that 15% is only in an environment where the price of oil is really high. If the 10-year average, let's say oil crashed and stayed below you know, $50 a barrel, well, Ecopetrol wouldn't have to pay any additional income taxes because that 10-year calculation, you basically under $67 a barrel, they don't have to pay anything additional. So you know, in that kind of uh, environment, uh, they also have very low break evens, so it would actually be, I think, a preferred investment if you were looking at the oil and gas sector and you wanted to hedge your downside risk from falling price of oil. You know, they're trading where they were when uh, oil went under thirty dollars a barrel for uh, you know months in 2016. You know, it was in the 30s, 40s for a lot of that time period. Um, they're trading, you know, close to where they were during COVID when WTI briefly went negative, when people didn't know if, you know, there would ever be, uh, you know, fuel demand the same again, uh, oil demand the same again. So essentially what you're saying is people who kind of missed the run up in oil stocks, in oil producers, this is a yeah. good one to potentially, I mean, not because financial. they're essentially producer. still priced at the lows and in an environment where in reality they're making more now than they ever have as a company. And if you look at their balance sheet quality, you know, their debt ratios, you know, EBITDA to debt, 
uh, you, you look at their uh, you know cash to debt. I mean, they're they're basically uh, in the same category as the U.S. majors. Mm -hmm. So you're getting the same kind of balance sheet. Um, for a fraction of the price. I mean, I, I think they're trading at about two times, like let's say 2.2, 2.3x yeah. free, uh, free cash flow. So the, the pricing of the stock in this kind of commodity environment is making the assumption that the company won't even last until the end of Petro's term. You know, the, Petro can only be, without amending the Constitution, which requires uh, the uh, approval of both the courts and the legislature, which he doesn't have the control of. He does well. He doesn't have the control of um, that. You know, there are friendly parties, but it's difficult to get a coalition, especially a coalition, to keep him in power. Right. In order for this to become a situation where you know the company is permanently impaired, okay, you need to have. Uh, you, you know, these people need to have control. If you look at the actual re reforms that were put into place, and then some of the other things that went on as well, you know, when the during uh, the Ivan Duque uh, regime, who he was the previous president, the uh, the uh, shares of Ecopetrol uh, they traded, you know, uh, teens, twenties, you know, high teens, twenties, um, and during uh, Duque, the uh, you know, excepting the COVID crash, um, Duque was using something called the Fuel Stabilization Fund in Colombia to essentially, uh, you know, support his popularity and, uh, uh, you know, similar to what uh, Bolsonaro was doing in Brazil, right, with uh, trying to get the state oil company to subsidize uh, domestic fuel pricing to help his popularity so that he could get reelected. So uh, basically, uh, the company has run up a balance uh, that uh, that is owed to it by the government for contributions to these fuel subsidies of three to four billion dollars. I think it's like twenty. It was I think it was like twenty trillion uh, Colombian pesos in the end of September. Or I think by the end of the year it's supposed to be like twenty nine. Uh, I think that's I think that's around f I you know an exchange rate in the head. But I think that's like four billion USD. So it's essentially uh, already. Uh, uh, earmarked for, uh, or maybe it's a little bit more than that, but the, the Congress has already earmarked about four billion USD next year. This is approved law, so it's basically the balance will in, in, will you know increase to the end of the year to about 29 trillion COP, and then next year the government has already committed, already put into law, already budgeted, paying that down by like 20 trillion. So it's sort of a give and take where they're going to pay some additional taxes, but the government is also going to pay a significant amount of money that is owed to the company by the public, right? So <clears throat> what, what we see here essentially is a massive discrepancy between perceived risk and actual risk. Yeah, I think that people think that because Colombia elected its first ever leftist president, I mean, that let's be clear here, uh, Colombia uh, by historical standards is a very conservative country. They uh, have, their central bank is perceived as being uh, uh, very independent uh, and very good uh, with, within uh, South America. It's one of the, definitely has one of the better reputations among Latin American uh, central banks. They just recently raised interest rates, I think two weeks ago, uh, in uh, opposition to Petro's wishes. So the central bank's doing what it wants, regardless of what Petro wants. Um, the, uh, the courts uh, have, uh, you know, other presidents in the past in Colombia have tried to amend the Constitution to, uh, to basically have, you know, more than one term available to them. Colombia has a one-term presidential limit. So I mean, in that way, there's less political risk than in the U.S. Um, so in the past, there have been you know uh, attempts to uh, modify this that, that the constitutional court has blocked. Uh, there was a, a previous successful attempt to change the constitution to allow for more terms, and then it went back to the one-term limit with uh, with the next president. Um, so you, you know, Wikipedia you, will tell you all about that. Uh, but anyway, you know, they have to get the law changed, and then the Constitutional Court has to approve that change. So it's not like they didn't elect an all-powerful dictator. Mm -hmm. You know, Colombia has is a constitutional republic like the United States. 
You know, it's it's the their systems of government are fairly similar. Um, you know, they've got a executive branch, a legislative branch, and a and a judicial branch, and you can't control everything that happens in the country without controlling every branch of government. So there are very strong checks and balances in Colombia, and the people who occupy the current positions of power in the court system, they they were all appointments made by. Uh, by conservative presidents, because mm -hmm. Colombia has never elected a leftist president until now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, am I saying that you know there's like no risk that nothing bad can happen? Of course not. You know, I mean, could could uh, could Petro stay in power? Could you know Colum the Colombian people be you know move farther to the left? You know, could they vote for more subsidies? you know, go out in the street and, you know, protest fuel prices. I, absolutely they could. But, you know, they people can do that anywhere. Yeah. So, you know, if you're if you're going to invest in, uh, you know, oil and gas companies, I mean, to me, it makes sense to invest in what's cheap and what's what has a history of paying out big dividends. Uh, Talking about dividends, I mean, what are you expecting? Well, I can tell you what I, I, I don't know what to expect in the next in the future. But I can tell you what has been the historical case. So over the past year, uh, they paid two dollars and something in dividends. The shares are ten dollars today. So you know if that if if the current pricing environment and their behavior as far as you know declaring dividends were to continue, then I think you would be looking at you know twenty to thirty percent yield on the dividends. Uh, since two thousand eight, uh, the I, the you know the farthest dividend history that I could get was going back to 2008, and since then they've paid like $22 a share in dividends versus a stock today that's at uh, you know 9.95 or something. So um, if this is a you know a company that you're willing to hold for 10 years and you know oil you know pricing kind of sticks around, uh, you know I think. I think you're going to get paid just in dividends. I mean, what you look, what you need to look for as an investor is you need to say, if nobody else buys this, if I can't convince anybody else that this is a good investment, am I still going to make money? Mm -hmm. And the only ways that that is possible, uh, you know, the three scenarios, and I've I've invested through all three of these scenarios. Uh, one, the company is worth more to some private enterprise than it is to you know whoever owns it at the time so you know Ecopetrol essentially owns Colombia they own all of the you know they own all of these uh, oil and gas leases we should talk about the exploration as well um, they own all these uh, you know oil and gas leases they own the ground they own pipelines they own roads they own utilities uh, they own refineries I mean it's you know billions and billions and billions in in assets and you know, the I, I don't think that Colombia is going to sell that. But you know, the question is, would it be worth more to Exxon Mobil, for example, than it's trading for today? I think it would be worth a lot more. Uh, it, you know, w so that's that's one way a buyout. Okay, it's a little big for a buyout, obviously, right? Uh, the other way is if, uh, if other people aren't going to buy the stock, the company can buy back stock. So. Uh, you know what's the probability that the company uh, you know buys back stock? Probably also pretty low, but you know at the same time, uh, YPF in Argentina recently. I mean, Argentina is you know much worse uh, as far as their you know governance quality. I think than Colombia. The institutions are much weaker. They went way you know down the rabbit hole into Peronism, uh, uh, Peron, Eva Peron, uh, and uh, socialism and. Uh, you know they are buying back shares for their national energy company. YPF was actually a big win that I had this year. Uh, I I I bought a lot of calls when the stock was trading in the twos. Uh, just this past week, I finished finished selling, um, and uh, I sold the last of my calls with the stock trading about eight dollars. So uh, that was well that was a that was a huge huge win for me. Um, so you you know if even YPF would buy back shares in the open market. I mean, maybe, you know, it's not uh, unfeasible that uh, Colombia or Brazil would uh, would do so. You know, you never know who the next guy for president's gonna be, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but anyway, let's say those first two are, you know, fairly, uh, 
improbable. And then the third way, obviously, is dividends. So uh, Petrobras is another name that I pounded the table on because it just got so ridiculously cheap because, you know, first it was Bolsonaro put a general in charge of the, country, of the company. And, you know, this is literally a company that was started by the Brazilian military. So I'm like, why are you guys worried that, you know, a, a Brazilian general is running the company, that w a company that was started by the military? Are there still competent technical people, competent executives involved? You know, then who cares who the CEO is, right? So, uh, you know, that was a name. I pounded this, the table r about $7 a share. Uh, that they've, you know, the shares have fluctuated. I think the highs have been 16 17 But in the meantime, I, I think they've, paid since, you know, that since uh, that kind of post-COVID when the shares crashed. Uh, I mean, they've paid, I think, close to $5 a share in, in dividends. It's, so been, it's been a good ride. The, the, re the returns, for a while. yeah, the returns from the dividends have just been incredible. So, um, you know, in this kind of hydrocarbon pricing environment, um, and there are other reasons why I think uh, Ecopetrol is incentivized to pay dividends. You know, it's part of the, basically that, that uh, FPPC balance, the fuel fund, um, it, can get, it can get reduced back to zero in two ways. One, and also the Petrol government wants to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. At least that's, what they, that's another goal that they've stated. So, you know, Duque was subsidizing domestic consumption. Petro has stated that he wants to stop subsidizing domestic consumption. So were they to do so, that would, that would basically be another tailwind for the company because they don't need to sell fuel into the domestic market cheaper and run up that uh, accounts receivable balance for the fuel stabilization fund. Um, so you know the government has definitely made it clear that they want to bring that balance down, that they want to pay that to zero, and then dividends which would be paid to uh, the government uh, as cash, will instead, uh, in lieu, reduce the balance of that fuel stabilization fund. So it's, it's sort of, you know, the, the government is definitely, I think, double dipping with changing the, the tax regime, but it's also been a give and take, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 the give has been higher taxes, which also affects Colombia's many private producers, right? I mean, of coal, of uh, other hydrocarbons, um, so you know, let, let, let's let's remember that this it's just they're not the only you know fossil fuels company in uh, in Colombia. They all the entire sector is affected by uh, by these changes. But in exchange for these changes, you know the the country is doing things that are better for the company than uh, were being done under the pro business pro-fossil fuels, I believe he was a shareholder in EC, um, f you know, previous conservative guy, mm -hmm. right? So it, I just think that people tend to, you know, run on these uh, headlines where, you know, Colombia is the next Venezuela, mm -hmm. and they don't stop and ask, you know, okay, well, what has ac what's actually happening in reality? You know, is this, you know, is this actually, you know, Marxism? <laughs> Or, you know, is it just kind of a, a slight, maybe temporary change in the political landscape and the tax regime? You know, how long is it going to take for these changes to actually impact the company? You know, uh, how much is it actually going to take out? I mean, to me, it looks like over the next couple years, unless you get, unless you you know, continue to see a really robust hydrocarbon pricing regime, it's, it's, it's more or less going to be a wash between, you know, what they're paying the company back that they ran up during Duque for the fuel stabilization fund and, you know, the additional that they're going to pay in taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was thinking that, uh, uh, you, know, you know, just take the net income and next year, you know, take 8% of it out, right, 8 10%. That's, that's probably going to be the hit. It's on net income. They're mm -hmm. not robbing the company. They're not selling the assets to, you know, to you know, do like social programs or something. And they're still exploring as well. Yeah, so um, that, that, that's another interesting thing. People, you know, especially this is really what's caught on in Colombian media. And I think this is more because of people playing Colombian politics than of doing, you know, actual sort of uh, objective analysis of, their, of the reality. The, uh, uh, the government suspended new exploration licenses and they suspended fracking, okay?
But the thing is that, one, Echopetrol's production isn't changing. Okay, they, they've actually maintained and increased their production. Um, uh, Colombian production is down a little bit, but they own assets outside of Colombia. They own a lot of assets in the United States. They own a lot of Permian assets. Their uh, Permian assets, I believe, are producing 50, 60,000 barrels a day of energy right now, which is 12, 13% of their total production. So, you know, it's a, it's a significant uh, it's a significant amount that's being produced outside of Colombia as well. Uh, within Colombia, they I think there's 200 and something, like two, maybe 210 maybe uh, active exploration licenses. All of those existing exploration licenses are being honored. They aren't stopping anything that's already been approved. Okay, so you know, and then of those 200 something that have been approved. Only about half of those are, you know, have active work taking place on them. So there's essentially an inventory of approved but unutilized exploration licenses that can also be used to maintain production. So again, until the next government, who until might the tense. next government, and then they come in and do, you know, new exploration licenses. I mean, maybe the next government will also be, you know, anti uh, oil exploration uh, in Colombia. But uh, you know, there's definitely there's there's a buffer there till the end of the uh, Petro presidency for them to keep you know, pursuing new stuff. They've also you know been doing all these joint ventures with uh, with Shell, with Petrobras, with uh, with other uh, you know big companies for offshore, right? So you've got you know another thing to remember is you've got you know conventional production, you've got unconventional fracking. Um, you've got offshore production. You've got all the stuff that they own uh, outside of Colombia, which is significant. Um, so uh, you know you you can't really just simplify all of it down to uh, they elected a Marxist who hates oil and the company won't exist in two years. It's just you know that's the assumption that's being made by the way that the company is priced right now in this oil and gas environment. I mean. You know, look at the I, look at the stock for Exxon Mobil. Look at XLE, mm -hmm. right? I mean, w these things are back at all-time highs. Mm -hmm. The Colombian National Oil Company is close to an all-time low. Mm -hmm. I mean, I put a small car into it, so. Yeah, well, I have I have several cars into it. <laughs> uh, not small, bigger than me, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, if I I mean, it would definitely be you know. It would definitely be a, a loss for me if I if it weren't if it didn't work out. You know, if if uh, you it's know, your single biggest position. Yeah, EC right now is uh, is my biggest position. Okay, cool, fantastic. So, if you want to follow Calvin, he's on Twitter. There is the handle below. There's also his Substack. So, what I like about your Substack is that you talk, you choose random stocks that you analyze. And then you also talk about life in Panama, um, which I enjoy reading about. So it's quite insightful. So I encourage people to sign up to Calvin's uh, Substack. I'm a subscriber myself. And then Calvin also has a premium newsletter specifically for oil, shipping, commodities, etc., where he really follows up on a weekly basis, etc. So it's quite, it's quite popular. It's doing yeah. really well. The results are fantastic. We'll do another video on that, on that whole topic. And there is also the, the link below. So, Calvin, yeah. thank you very much. I eh? yeah, really right appreciate on. it. Yeah. You can go to my website, thewanderinginvestor.com, and sign up to the private list. It's entirely free. This way, you will be getting insider information as I travel around the world looking for opportunities. Lastly, feel free to follow me on Instagram at thewanderinginvestor. I look forward to hearing from you.